All right, hello everybody, good morning. My name is Thomas Galvez and I am a member of the VTC committee and I will be the co-host of this workshop. Saigon South International School is honored to be hosting the ninth annual Vietnam Tech Conference in collaboration with Eunice Hanoi. It is also my honor on behalf of the VTC committee to introduce you to Luke Dyer, who will talk to us about modifying use of Google Slides to support project-based learning uh, in the upcoming workshop. Uh, Luke is the STEAM coordinator and ICT leader at British International School of Ho Chi Minh City. He has been a primary class teacher for the past 20 years in New Zealand, China, and Vietnam. Luke has always been interested in the way that new technologies are changing the world around us, and he is passionate about finding ways to harness these technologies in the classroom with purpose and impact. Everybody, welcome Mr. Luke Dyer. Hey there, everybody. Kia ora. It is nice to be here. I will just share my screen, and then we will begin. Okie dokie. Commit someone and present is hiding under there. Here we are. Okay. Kia ora. Uh, my name is Luke Dyer, as Thomas lovely said, and I'm the um, STEAM coordinator at the British School of Inter International School of Ho Chi Minh. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about how we use this technology we have in front of us. So if you've just come from listening to Craig, give the amazing keynote, you will have a double dose of the Kiwi accent. I apologize for that. It is who I am. Now, if I go to the next slide here, I am going to, okay. So quickly, I'll introduce me with a set of eight pictures, okay. I have a family. I have two daughters who, are, one is in year 13, one is at university. I've got a, a great insight into being a parent and an educator and a teacher. And I've seen things which work for my children, things which don't. So I've got a different take on the education system. I was a chef before I was a teacher. So I learned how to get on with people and work in tricky situations. I'm from New Zealand, one of the greatest countries on the world. Um, I love technology. It's been the driving force with my, um, my role as an educator. Um, I got taken across to China to teach there and I loved it. I learned how to look at it from a, a global perspective, which then brought me as a tech integrator and STEM coach here at the British International School of Ho Chi Minh. That last picture there is the Internet of Things. The, the world we live in has changed so fast. It is so different to what it was last year, the year before, the year before that. And while it excites me, it also terrifies me. So I spent a lot of my time working out how we can use this technology for good and support the, the children in our classroom to, to use the technology they have in a, in a positive way and not um, get caught up with the, the negative impact. And that last little picture there, I'm an OG uh, geek. I, I love playing role-playing games and reading fantasy stories and all that sort of stuff. Now, if we look into the next part here, if you've seen what Craig just said, this is, is very similar to his presentation, okay? These, these skills are always in the top of my mind, okay? They are not 100% on the money, but they're a pretty good and comprehensive list of what we should be focusing on in our lessons for our students. Um, I don't feel these are skills which develop naturally and many of our students. So we need to provide opportunities and scaffolds for our students to, to try and fail and build these skills so that they can develop the, the skill set they need for the world they're moving into. Okay, things like people management and coordinate with others and emotional intelligence, they sort of all fix together in this way that we ask our students to, to work within a classroom, but, but do we support them in that development? And I think that's something which I'm always thinking about. Cognitive flexibility is something which I don't feel a lot of us have. I've got to struggle to have that, that in my head to say, okay, this is what's going on. Can I change my thought? Can I, am I flexible with the way I'm thinking? Can I apply different situations and different thought processes the way we go through for every different situation? So 
that's something I'm always thinking about. And I think we need to make sure that we're bringing this into our classroom as much as we can, whether we're teaching kindergarten, primary, intermediate or secondary students. Okay. Now, another thing Craig talked about is this diffusion of innovation model. Um, it's been around for a long time. Okay, if you're like me, you were always put in that early adopters category. And but the thing is, everyone you were around at conferences and workshops tended to be in that category. And then you were passionate about something and you're working towards something. But when you came back to school, you had to try and pull others along with you. And that was difficult. Okay. Um, when we're doing that, it is it's tricky to try and show someone the passion you have when they are trying to cope with something different. Um, now, this has changed. Previously, you had those laggards and you had the late majority, but if we look at the world we've had in the last year, there is no space for the laggard and the late majority. Everyone has been pulled along to the left hand of, of, of the cycle there without any choice. We've been put into virtual learning environments, and by doing that, we, we just have to adapt. Whether we fully understand the pedagogy behind it or the reasons why, we just have to do it. Um, we've been given these tools, these learning management systems, which give us instant access to content, to our students, to our parent community, to others within our education community. We can deliver feedback instantly we can, we can look into the world of our students and see what they're doing at a moment's notice in real time. And it's fantastic, okay? And, and that's what's made the past year possible. That's what's allowed us to, to deliver content and curriculum and, and learning experiences to our children in a virtual environment. I think back to the days when teaching in New Zealand where it would snow. And snow doesn't happen very often in New Zealand, but if it snowed, the kids went to their cupboard and they pulled out their snowpack. And it was sitting there for one, two, three years maybe, and it had activities to do on a snow day. If a snow day was to happen in New Zealand, or well, next week or this year or next year, it would just be over the radio, school has gone virtual for the day, okay? It would just instantly, in my opinion, no longer have a closure, but just have a switch of learning environment. And that's through these tools we've been given. But I think what I'm really worried about now is, is not the tools, because they're fantastic. It's not the environment we're in, because we're learning to cope. We've done some amazing things in this last world, uh, last year um, with education. We've done some truly brilliant things. But my thought is like, all these environments, what's changed so fast and what have we lost? What are we neglecting? Those teachers who were the late adapters or the, the laggards who've been pulled into the virtual environment so fast, what things were they doing, which was fantastic? Because don't get me wrong, the laggards who I dealt with as an educator were fantastic teachers. They just were fantastic teachers offline and was showing them the reasons why we'd go digital with some tools to, to improve their teaching practice and the experience for their children. So for those late adapters and the laggards to be pulled into a virtual environment, what things have they lost from their practice? What things have we lost from our practice? What things are we not doing now because we are delivering in an online environment or, or a hybrid environment or, or, or a multiple different, different ways? How are we addressing all those skills? We go back to that um, job forum list of skills, how are we bringing those into our class and to whether it's a project based learning environment, which was the original idea behind this when we were teach, um, presented this in face to face, or in a hybrid environment. Okay, so that's that's the thinking I've got right now. Okay, so in my in my classroom, if I'm delivering a digital lesson, or if I'm delivering a lesson through hybrid model, I want to make sure that students have got opportunity for peer modeling, that they're able to develop that digital literacy. Is there opportunity to model and to comment on other children's work, to look at other children's work? I, I learned a lot through high school from saying nothing and watching other children work, ask questions and think for me in a way. I was a very shy child. We've got lots of those kids in our class. Um, do we have those scaffolds set in place so that if the child, the student is not able to see you, 
in a lesson or communicate with you instantly or be there? Do they know the steps they should take or have some sort of model there to work through so that they can continue the learning and they don't sort of hit a roadblock? Are there assessment and reflection points within your learning? Because they're important. Are they there within each lesson for children in a virtual and hybrid environment um, or within a project-based learning? Are they there so that kids can look and assess where they are and where they need to get to? It's, for me, it's essential. Have we embedded those within our virtual lessons? Um, are, are we using exit tickets where children get a chance to, to see what they learnt or assess what they learnt or identify those key skills and learning dispositions within their lesson. So they're really cementing what's going on or are we going lesson finished, tick out of the Zoom chat and we're into the next one because we're in a very busy cycle. So it comes down to me as those, those systems which assess and assist our children within that learning. Are we making sure they are there? Not just some lessons, but all lessons because it's going to be those are the things which I feel is going to help our students move along and and succeed in this environment which we're working in. Okay, now this here is something which I was in the virtual innovator program from Google this year, and it was it was a mind blowing experience. Uh, Carlos, if you're there, you you changed my mind on, on a lot of way we do things and really empowered me, but. I used to use this feature of make a copy for each student all the time. Anytime there was a, a worksheet, a presentation, make a copy for each student so I could see how each student was engaging. I could minute by minute notice if Timmy had actually begun his work, was halfway through his work, was stuck on his work, needed help or had completed and needed a challenge to extend what they were doing. But what I did by doing that is I took away the opportunity for peer moderation and mediation and seeing what your colleagues or your other students in your class are actually doing. So I took away that, I think it's a right to see and be monitored, mentored and modeled by, by your peers in your class. I, I feel by making a copy, we, we lost that. So now I, I have one document and I make that visible for all students. Now, Here's what we used in the Innovator program. Each week there was a workbook and there were six of us in this group and the six of us had a series of tasks and things to report and work on. Every two weeks we had a new document. It was a fantastic way to look at other people's work to see how they were going on things. And then we had opportunities to read and respond to their work. So we were leaving peer assessment and moderation the whole way through. It was fantastic. Here is a workshop which Carlos and I ran at 21st Century Learning in Hong Kong, where we went through a project-based learning cycle for problems within our school, and each person had a set of slides within one document. It can get messy when you've got a big group of people, but it allowed for a lot of opportunities for learning within that environment. And this is a project I've done within my class, um, just finished it um, at the start of this year where we had one document for group work. So there were six groups of four students in my class and they all had a set of documents to work through. There were certain places for checks along the way. If they were stuck, they could leave a comment for me and I could interact with it instantly. So again, weekly as a lesson over a larger space of time or within groups, it all works. Now, there's a whole lot of different skills we can have. And if we go back in time, these have been here for the last 20 or 30 years. All the mind mapping tools, all these learning uh, skill sets which we have been developing, they're there, they're successful, they make an impact on our students. They allow them to, to look at a skill and pull it apart. Okay, They give them the strategies and the systems to, to further their ideas by having a set of skills to work through. So let's run through a few of them here now, okay? Just protocols of checkpoints, timers, clear expectation and modeling. Uh, I use a lot of master slides. So I will take the slide, I'll open the master system and modify it. Then the students don't have to worry about 
changing things within the slide, there's only a certain text box which they're interacting with and it just changes the way it works, okay? So, thinking hats. This is an example from a student group I had. Edward de Bono's thinking hats, I used them uh, back in my first years of teaching in the early 2000s all the time. We used to have physical hats around the classroom and children would go and take the blue hat and put them on their head and say, well, what's some problems I've got going on here? Or the black hat and do the negative things. We can still do this in a virtual environment. And it just provides an opportunity for students to, to stop, to look at what they're doing in their project or in their um, lesson and say, okay, how can I pull this apart into the bigger parts of the problem? Virtual post-it notes. If we want students to, to come up with different ideas, we don't want to come up with the first idea and then run with it. And I find with my students, that's what they, the system they're in, okay? Um, at an international school where they, learning is of huge importance to most of my students and the families they come from, they are busy all day long with academies and extra classes. They, they want to know what they need to do to get the task completed. And, and, and we need to reprogram some of their thinking and bring it back so they are looking at what do I need to do to understand my thinking. And things like this is, for me, is what's bringing, bringing that back, getting them to slow down and really look at a challenge they're going through. Um, the Kanban board. This is a picture. There's a link there to what a Kanban board is. I love them. Um, again, it came from the Innovator Academy, and this is just a great visual. So here is um, a, a picture of it, but if we go further on to the next page, this is a working Kanban board in one of my classes. So here are four different parts of the project which the group is working on, and they're testing their code. Oh, sorry, it's a not interactive, this one. They're working on their code. They want the teacher to review. They just take the yellow post-it note and they drag it into the next bit. With the plan, the teacher is reviewing it, they move it across and it visualizes the process they're working on as a group, where they are, okay, and where they need to work on next, who's working on different parts. It's just building those systems into the learning for them. Now, if you go to ditch that textbook, this is an amazing website, which is someone's put together, the link's down the bottom there, and they have created all of the classic virtual graphic organizers, okay? And they're all Google Drawings templates. You can modify them, you can make them work for you, and, and they're fantastic. It gives you that opportunity to, to really look at what's going on and stop and think. And if we're looking at a science lesson, a Venn diagram, if you're looking at a, what have we learned, a KWL is fantastic, uh, hexagonal thinking, amazing stuff look into it it is really really good okay um single point rubrics this has come new to me now i usually create rubrics rubrics with my students and then we will modify the rubric throughout the lesson or throughout a sequence of lessons so they are coming up with the language and the vocabulary but this here is a new idea where you've got your standards it's just single point okay you're not going where are you on this continuum you're saying this is the learning point we're looking at, and it can be a snapshot within a lesson um, or a, a checkpoint within a series of lessons or a project. And it's, okay, where are you on these three set criterias? I am, I'm wondering, and I like this, and it just gives you as a teacher an understanding of where your child is, or student is working at, and then a, a thing to work towards. Assessment tools, okay, exit tickets, whatever we call them, use them. They are fantastic. Uh, it can just be, my favorite one is just using the comment on Google Slides. I'll say to my students, okay, can you go to the person two above you and look at their Kanban board and can you leave a comment thinking what, what you feel should be their next step? Okay, if you don't feel you want to use it within your class, you can use the Flipgrids, the Nearpods, the Google Forms, Socrative, Padlets. They're great ways, pose a question, and then allow them to answer it. Um, brilliant. Now, these two people here, Chris Hart and Leslie Macbeth, were our design coaches on the Google Innovator program and follow them on Twitter if you are not already. They, they do some amazing things and they are great sharers of knowledge and 
go and see them. Now, we're going to give something a go. If you see there, it says bitly.vtcluke. We have got four minutes, five minutes. It's really short time space. I'm really apologize for that. But type that in and go to that web page. Okay, it's another set of slides. I am going to, okay, so bit.ly VTC Luke. If someone wants to share it in the chat, that would be great. I am going to exit this slide and jump into it, which is here. Now, this is a, I'm oh, sorry, caught, caught there. This is an example of a workbook which I would use with my students. Okay, and up there, we've got some people joining already. That's fantastic. Let me just. Grab that there, and I don't know where the chat feature is. I'll leave that. Someone else can do that for us. So in this workshop here, what I'd like you to do, if you look at that first set of instructions, it says select pages four through 10. So here's page four, and I'm just gonna select down to page 10. I'm gonna copy them and paste them. So now I have made my own copy of that slide. And then I'm going to change that to Luke. Can you do that now? And while we're waiting, just add in five facts about me, about you, not about me. You know what I mean? Uh, I am from New Zealand. If we had a lot longer time, we could carry on with this. But give it a go as we're going on now. Now, if you see there is, it says after five minutes, we're going to, maybe not five minutes, your slides will change within the ranking. I can do this with the year four class. I'm sure that I can do it with you amazing people without getting too messed up. Okay, we're gonna run through a really quick cycle and see how things go. Okay, so once you've got your set of slides and we've got some people in here now, that's me. Just copy and paste. Great. Okay, and then add your name and give it a go. Okay, so I've got a set of seven slides. I know that's going to do the maths to make the contents page. The first one is facts about me. That's super easy, okay? The next one is a problem. And for this, I tried to make it easy for you. What's a problem you need to work on in your classroom? Well, I've got lots. It could be the the systems for students getting um, onto task straight away. It could be a way of me collecting in workbooks for marking. It could be a way of organizing things. There's many different systems we need to work on in a classroom. And, and, and that's trying to come up with an idea right now. So if you get a chance, just on that second slide, add in a problem you've got in your classroom right now. Okay, and just have, have a think about it. Once you've written it down, now, if I was doing this with a class, I would get them to to try and find an image and they would add an image across over there. So if it was organization, they might find a picture of organization systems in a maker space and just pop a picture there to visualize someone else's idea or Google image searches idea of what that could be. Okay. Hey Luke, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you uh, just uh, give the link again? There seems to be some problems with the link. It's not working for um, some people. I do apologize. Okay. And there's five minutes remaining. Five minutes, cheers. Okay, so I'm gonna share the link in two ways. Um, I'm gonna share the link in the chat, which should be. Said, look. It's there? Okay, so it's in the chat. If you can click on it, and I will also share the longer link if that works, because sometimes, Bitly, thanks, Rince. Oh, it's nice to see you here, buddy. Um, sometimes Bitly doesn't work in some countries. I do apologize, I didn't even think about that. Okay, so once you have added in, and we've got populated with lots of different people, which is great. Just go back, I think, uh, dum, dum, dum. where was me? I was, so Michael, you can, your number, page number 11. So Michael would just go back up here and he would write in here. So that's how I use it in a class. So students would know where they are once we've done that generation of everyone's documents the whole way through. And if you see it goes to 186, that's a, a full class set of students. Um, back to that, the big question, 
Then after that, the next part, I would say, okay, what's some solutions? Now, these are just simple uh, text boxes or, or word shapes, but you can type in them and write as many different ideas as you want. So maybe a solution would be, type it down, another solution. So we're generating those ideas and just showing the systems in a virtual environment. Uh, in class, I'd have post-it notes and big bits of butcher paper all over the room for people to write ideas down and on whiteboards. But digitally, we don't have that opportunity. Maybe you're a specialist teacher who goes between different classes. You don't always carry the resources with you. So those are there for you. Um, moving down. Now, this would be a chance for the person above to come down and write down some ideas for you. And what I mean, the person above, if I was up here at so 18, that was me, I'd say, Michael, can you come down and have a look at my ideas and write some solutions from your point of view? And then the person below would be that second part and write some solutions. So we're generating ideas from different points of view. They don't have the same, um, same bias onto an issue, so they're bringing in their ideas. Then down here, just bringing in a simple graphic organizer for you to take one of those solutions and pull it apart. And then again, pulling it apart even further. Now, this is set up for a, a it, it's a contrived situation, be very different in your class. But giving students an opportunity to work in this way means they must interact with their other students in a in a meaningful fashion. And then they're just working through that scaffold of a problem, taking it, pulling it apart, and then slowly developing it further. Now, if I look at the time limit here, we've got three more minutes. So in that three minutes, do you have questions? <laughs> I'm sorry, I've rushed through this completely. I hope you've got something out of it, but I would love the opportunity to answer any questions that you might have. And if you want to, you can just unmute your microphone and um, give it a go if you'd like to. We don't have very long, but I'd love to hear anything you'd like to say. Silence. That's okay. Hi, Luke. It's Renz. Hey, Renz. I have a question. Yep. So how do you... Um, What's the system in terms of, so I use slides as well, but yep. you know, I do a lot of uh, students do reflections, um, uh, exit tickets, those things, but I you know, have like 60 kids. So I feel like um, I don't get to, to, to actually read them. So that's my, I'm struggling with that. What yeah, I understand that completely. I, I was using a lot of exit tickets and I found that it was it was working to a point but as you said to get through them you'll spend three hours going through and providing feedback for each one um, i'm using a lot of direct messages on um, on google slides and google docs so if they're working on it when they get to a certain point they need help they will at luke dyer um, in a message that comes straight to me but i'm also getting them to add a couple of people in their group so they're building a, a, a group solution to a problem. So maybe it's, it's sort of, I, I guess in a way it's crowdsourcing some answers. Um, and that seems to be successful once we've built the systems and the trust in place with the students. But it is a lot of time and effort, which, which becomes quite tricky. Um, sometimes if it's a, a key problem, which a lot of people are facing or a question, I'll screenshot it and then I'll add it to the slide deck and, and then solve it for the whole group and then let people know that, hey, this is Timmy's issue and this is the solution we came up with together if you'd like to have a look. So the next person who has the same problem, like a frequently asked questions, have a check at this slide and then come and see me after if you still need some more help with what you're, what you're working through. Um, systems, yeah, working out what could work. Okay, we'll go ahead and um, stop there. If you have additional questions for Luke, please head to the Whova app and go into his um, uh, session presentation. And there's a, there's a place where you can put additional questions there and you can keep the conversation going on this uh, great presentation that Luke did. So if you can uh, uh, please thank and give a, I guess a virtual or in your video thank round of applause.